Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the 13th edition of Primetime Pars, where we feature Lafayette alumni who have gone on to excel in their chosen fields. Primetime Pards, a Zoom show featuring Lafayette alumni, is presented by the Department of Athletics in partnership with the Communications and Development Divisions of the college. I'm Gary Laubach, and I welcome you, and I will once again serve as your host. This evening, we actually have a format first, as we welcome multiple guests to Primetime Pards. Joining us are three Lafayette grads who are currently on the Lafayette football coaching staff. Cornerback, cornerback coach Jeff Sejour, class of 2006, defensive coordinator Mike St. Germain, class of 2007, and head coach John Troxell, class of 1994. Before we get started, just a few announcements for those of you who are watching. For optimal viewing of tonight's show, changing to speaker view right now is strongly recommended. To ensure the best possible experience for everyone, the microphones of all attendees will be muted. And during the audience Q&A portion of the show, please utilize the Q&A feature, which can be found by opening participants. Once again, our guest tonight, Jeff Sejour, class of 2006, Mike St. Germain, class of 2007, and head coach Don Troxell, class of 1994. And it's a busy week as they prepare for the Maroon White Spring football game, which will be on at noon on Saturday. And just a little background on all three of the guys. In December, Coach Troxell was named the 29th head coach in program history. He comes to Lafayette after 16 years as the head coach of Franklin and Marshall, taking his team to the postseason nine times. Mike St. Germain comes to Lafayette from Kutztown University, where he spent the past three seasons as a defensive coordinator and linebackers coach he will take on the exact same duties as an assistant coach at Lafayette. Jeff Sejour moves with Coach Troxel from FNM, where he was the special teams coordinator and linebackers coach. He will coach the cornerbacks for the Leopards. Gentlemen, welcome to Primetime Parts. Thanks for taking time out of what I know has been a very spring for all three of you and joining us tonight. And Jeff, I'm going to start by chatting with you, if uh, the other two don't mind. And Jeff, uh, talk a little bit about your, your childhood. I know you were raised in Spring Valley, New York, but you really didn't end up going to high school in that area. And what's the story behind that? Appreciate you having me, Gary. Um, my story is kind of interesting because my brother actually went to Don Bosco Prep in Ramsey, New Jersey. And although we grew up in Spring Valley, uh, my mom uh, wanted to raise us uh, through Catholic school. So all through from kindergarten through eighth grade, I went to Catholic school. And then when it came down time for high school, my brother had the option of going to a local Catholic school in New York or Don Bosco prep. And he was actually registered to go to Albertus Magnus in New York. When my mom ran into another family, they suggested that Don Bosco would be better. Um, she registered for him, him that week and he ended up enrolling at Bosco uh, became kind of a uh, family for me as well. I was always up there to see his games or to participate in any uh, camps that were held on campus. And I got to know the coaching staff and it was just a, a done deal that I would go to Don Bosco. Uh, my brother actually wouldn't let me apply to any other of the <laughs> Catholic schools in the area. So it was, it was uh, pretty much written for me. Did your mom have to pull up roots or was this uh, something where you basically went off to school on your own? No, no, it was, literally live in upstate New York, according to some, but I am six minutes from the Jersey border. In terms okay. Of where I grew up. So it was generally an hour commute because I had to take a bus from Spring Valley to another local school and then jump on another bus uh, to commute with other New York residents uh, to Don Bosco prep. So the mornings were long, uh, but it wasn't anything where my family had to move. It was, it was pretty much seamless in that way. Many sports fans obviously know uh, Bosco because of uh, their history and heritage, but they're also a very good academic school. And I'm sure that was part of the decision for your mother to send both of her boys there. Absolutely. Uh, my brother set a high standard when it came to academics. And I was lucky enough as a kid, uh, we used to take trips to the library. Uh, we were always reading. I used to compete with him uh, to see who can read the books the fastest. So he uh, instilled a lot in me in terms of putting school first and then my mom was the one to kind of uh, crack the whip when necessary. 
uh, because she wouldn't let me participate in sports if my report card didn't look the way it needed to. Um, and I had to make sure homework was done before I could do anything. So mm -hmm. having those two uh, pushing me and uh, motivating me and also holding me accountable helped tremendously. And I know you had a, a love for sports. So obviously uh, doing the academic things you needed to do allowed you to play what, three sports there? Yes. So to keep me out of trouble, essentially, I uh, played football in the fall, uh, basketball in the winter, and then I ran track in the spring. Um, track was more so because of my brother. I wanted to essentially be like him. Um, I tried to follow in his footsteps and uh, live up to his example. I was a baseball kid, mostly growing up. Uh, I pitched as a kid. And then when I got to high school, I could not play both. So the decision to run track was more so uh, to honor my brother. Speaking of your brother, what's, what's his situation now? He is currently finishing his second year of uh, an MBA from Carnegie Mellon. Uh, he actually graduated from Lafayette uh, with a degree in chemical engineering, uh, went on to Georgia Tech uh, to get his PhD and worked in the industry before deciding to switch. Um, and Carnegie Mellon was pretty much the best option for him. Uh, so he's doing all right right now. Yeah, I, I would say so. Yes. Sounds like your mom did a fabulous job. She did. She did. She, uh, like I said, she had a standard that we all had to live up to and she held us accountable, which was, which was huge for me. You excelled in all three sports there. I know you, you won an Ironman award. You want to talk a little bit about that? Yes. So uh, the Ironman award, according to uh, Don Bosco standards, you have to be recognized um, in two different sports and also maintain um, an academic standard above uh, 3.0, if I remember correctly. I could be wrong there. But what it entails is it, it speaks to the Ironman name. Um, they got the Ironman name because they won two state championships in the same exact day, uh, the Catholic School League and the New Jersey League um, years ago. But it's meant to honor student athletes who perform you know, on the field or on the court or in, and in the classroom. And it gives you this plaque that allows you to get into any event um, athletically for the rest of your life uh, for free and, and your name is on the on a wall um, in the entrance of the school that also recognizes you. Knowing you wanted to follow the footsteps of your brother I assume that's what directed you to Easton. It is it is uh, I was a track athlete and I got connected to Lafayette uh, my sophomore year in high school I ended up doing fairly well uh, that year. Um, Lafayette was something that I always appreciated. Like I said, it became a family just the same way Don Bosco did. And I got to see my brother compete in different track and field events. Uh, I got to know the coaching staff very well. Uh, when it came time to pick a college, it was between football or track. And um, leaning the track route made the most sense uh, from a financial standpoint. And academically, I couldn't go wrong coming to Lafayette, seeing the success my brother had. Mm -hmm. And it just felt like home. Now, uh, Coach Trox has alluded to the fact that you are without question the smartest of all the assistant coaches and maybe a little bit smarter even than Coach Trox. I don't know if that's the case. But you you, you majored in neuroscience? Yes, sir. Are you, I mean, the only other step you could take would be a guest host of Jeopardy. <laughs> I think um, Mike Bialab is a, uh, is a neuroscience major. So neuroscience, the football? I mean, how, how did that go over with mom? Um... That's funny you should ask. Um, she, if you ask her, she probably want me to go into medicine, which is where mm -hmm. I was leaning towards. Um, when I graduated, my plan was to go to med school and due to some family events and decisions that I thought uh, were best for the family, I moved back to New York, uh, took a job as a scientist in a lab in uh, Westchester where I worked for a year and a half. Um, then I took a job in a uh, outpatient facility in Maryland uh, working uh, with uh, neurodegenerative diseases and uh, things of that nature. And eventually at Georgetown doing cancer research. And that's kind of where I thought I would end up uh, doing something, whether it be lab science or related to medicine. Um, I started to substitute teach uh, in Fairfax County, Virginia. Uh, got a chance to be in front of students talking about Lord of the Flies uh, of all books. And, oh, yeah, very familiar with it. Right, An another book that my brother and I shared in our years uh, as, as elementary students and saw what I could do as a teacher, uh, captivated an audience of kids who I remember being on the other side of it and 
giving my teachers a, a hard time. Uh, I kind of found, fell in love with teaching. Uh, teaching led to coaching and through, you know, powers you know, bigger than me, uh, led me here to coach football at Lafayette. So it's, I'm just uh, trying to fulfill the purpose that's been put in front of me. Well, you certainly had a, a great career to look back on at Lafayette, a couple of Patriot League championships, uh, outstanding in the track and field area, Patriot League title in the triple jump. Uh, so there was certainly, without question, a love of athletics. Yes, sir. Absolutely. Kept me grounded and uh, helped me stay focused in the classroom as well. I know you uh, spent a little time as a professional athlete. Tell me a little bit about the Haiti story. So it's funny, I, I didn't get to compete the spring of my senior year. Um, and after I graduated, I had no you know, thought to continue track and field. But my, my cousin who triple jumped as well um, at Harvard, he went to University of Texas to compete as a grad student. He also didn't get to compete his senior year. So he had an extra year of eligibility. Um, down there visiting him for Texas Relays, he mentioned he'd be moving to the DMV area and to train at George Mason University in the triple jump. Um, and being that my parents were born in Haiti, I could compete um, as a dual citizen. So it was pretty much an easy decision. You know, I moved to Maryland initially, then eventually made my way to Virginia, but we trained for four or five years, um, chasing the dream um, to compete in the Olympics. Uh, I was never successful. Um, my cousin ended up finishing 11th in Athens, uh, but it was something that I kind of dove into. I was working full time and training full time. And as, as arduous as that was, uh, it was great for me because mm -hmm. I put it all out there. I did it. Um, I could look back on it and appreciate what I learned through that injuries and everything under the sun, but it was definitely um, a great experience. Your aspirations eventually led you uh, to FNM with Coach Troxel in 2021. Uh, I assume you have not regretted any of the decisions you've made in life. Uh, not at all. Not at all. I, I love what I do as a coach. I um, definitely appreciate Coach Troxel for keeping in touch over the years and um, the great relationship that was fostered here at Lafayette. Uh, gave me an opportunity to coach. And uh, looking back on it, I'm right where I'm supposed to be. Tell me a little bit about Coach Troxel. What is it about him that led you to him? as opposed to, I guess it's pretty easy to understand what led him to you. There, I'm guessing he's listening, so I can't say too much <laughs> bad about him. But uh, it's, it's the leadership for me. I've worked at many places and different avenues and uh, professions and um, who I work with and who I work for has been uh, the most important. And from day one, he's been a, a tremendous leader to me, set a great example, and has also given me uh, the opportunity to grow in my role Give me responsibility, uh, give me the opportunity to lead others. And that's been uh, the best um, experience in all of this, like getting to FNM and having a chance um, to coordinate with him and um, to uh, coach a room of, of young men. It, it was, and to see what he had done there and to make sure I made to live up to that standard that he had set. So uh, working with Coach Troxel, he's, he's just a, he's a regular guy um, and gets along with everybody and it, it fits my personality. We one, a, final question, one final question, uh, Jeff, uh, before we move on to Mike. Uh, what is life like as an assistant coach? I would assume that, uh, you know, you're always ready to, to pack up. You're always ready to move on. Uh, how difficult is the life of an assistant coach? Uh, I, don't, I don't find it difficult. Um, to be honest, we're following um, whatever Coach Troxel has laid out in terms of the the message, uh, the example, and uh, what we want to build here. Uh, I've always been taught, um, you know, the grass is greener where you water it. So uh, my feet are planted here. Uh, I'm with a great group of uh, men. We have a great culture that we're trying to build here. So for me, it's it's about uh, leading um, through the example that's, that the head coach is giving you and do my best every day. I can't think of a better role model. Jeff, we'll be back and talk to you a little bit later, but thanks for the time. Thank you. All right, let's move on to uh, Mike St. Germain, class of 2007. Mike, uh, out of Morristown, tell us a little bit about your, uh, your high school career, your family life early on. Uh, I was lucky to go to Morristown High from 1993 and, or 1999 and finish up in 2003 and 
played for Coach Purcelli with a really good group of guys through the course of my time there. And uh, they had won you know, several state championships leading up to it. And unfortunately, we couldn't get one, but we were always pretty close and really competitive. And for me, it was uh, really one of the first opportunities to play football. I hadn't played in Pee Wees or anything like that. And uh, to me, it was just something that I dove in and really enjoyed it. And, you know, I learned a ton and, uh, you know, was really excited for more. Uh, home life for me, I was the oldest of three boys. Um, and uh, my dad and my mom, you know, provided a great household for us to learn and grow and uh, really enjoyed my time in New Jersey. Obviously, uh, that led to coming to Lafayette. Uh, tell us a little bit about what went into making that decision? Probably after Thanksgiving, my senior year, Coach Farragalli came into school and kind of explained to me, you know, this is the internet was starting to become a thing. I think AOL and some of that stuff was starting to become, you know, more mainstream. But at that time, you know, there, there wasn't a lot of, uh, you know, I didn't have a lot of awareness, wasn't thinking too much beyond obviously knocking out football and knocking out schoolwork and, you know, start talking to other places about going to college. And, you know, he came in, presented it, and then, you know, had an opportunity to sit at the home with us and got to a point in January where it was him and Coach Devani in the home. And then we got a chance to come visit the place and, you know, taking some time after the visit, it just seemed like it was a, it was a great fit, it was a great match, and then we could make it work. So it was something that I really – you know, I could see myself doing, I knew it was going to be hard work, but I knew that I thought it'd be well worth it. And it was. What were your aspirations? I know you were a history major. What were your aspirations? Uh, I'm sure at that point, you didn't think uh, football would be uh, your vocation. No, what were your no, I, I figured I'd end up actually going back and teaching high school and coaching football. That, that was probably more of the main thought than anything. And you know, if I could make anything of a career after, great. But beyond that, it was mostly in that mode of trying to figure out how to get some kind of education certificate and get back to New Jersey and teach and coach. You had a great career at Lafayette, Patriot League Championship in 06, all Patriot League first team, all American first team. Uh, tell us a little bit about your football memories. They have to be good ones. We, we had really good teams from 03 to 06 and I was really lucky to be a part of it and uh, you know 04, 05, 06 every year was a new year every year there was a new challenge or something different would come up and we were able to rise up and meet it and to me those were the things that you know I thought probably pushed me further into coaching than I thought I would go just because you have that success and you have that background and you know I could go from 04 beating Richmond down there to mm -hmm. win the conference championship here to 05, you know, obviously beating Richmond at home and having, you know, some tight games and other spots throughout the course of the year. And then obviously winning on the lot, you know, in the last two and a half minutes at Lehigh to go back to the playoffs and then getting an opportunity to continue the season at App State. And then 06 was kind of an up and down year, but I, you know, everybody as a senior group, we kind of were able to get things going in the right direction late in the year and finish up the right way, beating Lehigh and getting the first at least Patriot League championship on the new field there. So that was good. Boy, you're jogging my memory. I did all those games and it, it was just the pleasure following those teams yeah. for sure. I, I mean, nothing can beat the Richmond game down at Richmond. That was spectacular. Even the trip to App State was a, a great football game. I remember it very well. You know, I asked some people, give me some adjectives about Mike St. Germain, and they said ten tenacious, and he will outwork everybody. I is that kind of the philosophy you bring to coaching? Uh, yeah, I guess. <laughs> At least that's <laughs> what I've been doing. Um, but no, it's uh, definitely, you know, I think something that carries over from as a player that it's just instilled to you in the end as an athlete that there's work to be done. And, you know, there's at the end of the day, you're going to fall back to your level of training, whatever that is. So you better put a lot of work into it and, uh, you know, the good times or the bad. So for me, it's always been about the preparation and being ready. 
And, uh, you know, a lot of that was physical for a long time and it's more on the mental side of it now and trying to help the guys have success on Saturdays. So I'm I know you had professional football aspirations, uh, the Austin Wranglers in the arena football league, the CFL, AFL, NFL tryouts. How disappointed were you that uh, all of that uh, didn't work out the way you thought it should? I think at the end of the day, I was lucky to have the opportunities and, you know, it was just one of those situations where as the years go by, you just understand that, Hey, that window's closing. And when it was time to pull the plug, it was right. And mm -hmm. you know, it, I was, again, to me, I was afforded a lot of those opportunities because of the guys I played with here and, you know, sit around and you throw, and you kind of accolade out for an offensive lineman. And usually you have some other people around you helping out, you know, whether it was guards or backs hitting the hole or whatever it is, quarterbacks getting the ball out early. So there's a lot of things that went into it. So I, I was afforded a lot of opportunities because of my time here and the people here. What led you to coach Trox at FNM? Uh, 2009, I believe, a couple of years there. Yep. Uh, actually, it was, you know, I had an opportunity to go coach at another school. And uh, I was, I had interviewed and, you know, I was going to work with the safeties and having played offensive line, not a lot of crossover. And uh, at that time, there had become an opening on his staff. It was over the summer and, you know, I was pretty much about 48 hours away from taking this job. And he and I got on the phone uh, and uh, he more or less said, hey, do you want to at least, you know, come coach the D-line and you'll have a shot at least sounding like you know what you're talking about at least with the offensive line versus defense line crossover. So, and I, I sat there and got off the phone. I was like, yeah, he's right. So, and not only that, you know, it was a little bit closer and getting an opportunity to work with Trox again. I really enjoyed my time around him when he was here as an assistant coach. So I knew it would be a lot of fun getting down there and getting it going. You move on then to University of Virginia. I think that was probably as much about football as it was about uh, getting a, more education, right? Yeah. Yeah, I was able to get some work on my master's degree and then, uh, you know, get some hours towards that. And then the other part for me was I got a complete football education and some different things and just the way that level had worked and at an ACC school and whether it was the football side, the recruiting side. So I was involved in a lot of different things and I, I learned a ton. and It was tremendous that way. That's kind of the, the map that a lot of assistant coaches uh, kind of use that they have to end up coaching all kinds of positions if indeed they aspire to be a head coach, right? I, I think it's good and it's something that, you know, whether it was my time playing offense or then being back on offense at UVA for two years, it, it's something that, you know, in terms of prep and things that I think about or we think about as a defensive staff during the week, it's, it's afforded me well going forward. So I've been real lucky to have that background. I think every coach takes a little bit from the coaches they had. Uh, can you talk a little bit about Coach Devani? Absolutely. You know, I think in terms of some, one of the things that he probably said that stuck with me the most was that if it was easy, everybody would do it. And uh, it shows up in every walk of life. So that, that, that saying goes a long way. And, you know, whenever things get tough or whenever you see somebody kind of, you know, want to back down, it's like, come on, dude, let's go. <laughs> then on to Kutztown where you really had successful years. Uh, that was a, a, a great program when you came, well, not so much when you came, but certainly when you left. Uh, Coach Clements, uh, Marcel Cordman, who was a captain here, uh, a lot of coaches and players there set a standard and were doing really well. And I, I helped and, you know, it was uh, a lot of fun. We won the, the Eastern side of the conference two years in a row and 19 and 21, unfortunately 20 was a wash, but, and then in 21, we were able to win the conference title, win the conference championship, win that championship game and getting an opportunity to go and play in the playoffs two years in a row and coaching that as atmosphere and, get the guys going and being at their best. That was, that was a tremendous experience. I was very lucky to be a part of it. So how difficult, how difficult is it then to walk away from that? I know you probably always didn't mind coming back to Lafayette for sure. Coming back with coach Troxel, that was certainly uh, something you probably also didn't mind doing at all. 
Uh, but it also takes a toll, I would think, on the family. Uh, you know, your wife, Stephanie, you have a son, John, a daughter, Lucy. I would think maybe the assistant coach's life is tougher on them than it is necessarily on the coach himself. Uh, it, it, there's definitely times where it's, you know, I, I, I do my best to make up some mileage in that respect. And my wife's been great. She understands it. And our, you know, our kids, uh, John and Lucy, they, they enjoy being around the team and around the facility and they'll be around the facility more and more. So I think getting them involved in, in it as much as possible helps in that respect. So, yeah. So my final question to you is, uh, how has it been so far? Uh, working with the, the defense, which really has quite a few players back from last year. Looks like a good, solid nucleus. Uh, how, how are things working out? It's been a good spring so far. You know, 13 practices in. The, the effort to the ball has been good. I, I think we've got, you know, at least 75% of what we're going to run in the fall in. And they're handling it for the most part. And you know, I'd say over half the group is running to the ball well and executing at a high level, and we got to get everybody there. So we got some great time. to work with intelligent kids, right? Or men? Yeah, no, they, and it's a good group of guys, and and they want to be good, and they want to be great. So I, I want to try and help them get there. So that that's my biggest thing is, you know, we're we're trying to, you know, we, we joked, you know, we don't want to microwave anything. You want to bake it. You want to do it right, but. We want, to, we want to get this thing going as fast as possible. And part of that is making sure those guys have high effort and they're executing at a high level. Well, using the uh, cooking analogy, I'm going to go to the head chef. Uh, Mike, thanks uh, for spending a little time. We'll come back to you too in a bit. And uh, let's move over to John Troxell, class of 94, Fred M. Kirby, the second class of 42 head coach. Coach, it's, it's great to see you. It's great to see you in the office and uh, I'm sure it's been a, a busy, busy spring for you. Derek, thanks. And, and thanks for having us. And, you know, it's been a lot of fun, uh, a lot of work. You know, the guys have put into this and, uh, and I, you know, we're just excited to be back. I mean, uh, with a chance to, to make everybody proud, you know, all the, all the guys that we've coached, all the guys we've played with, all the alums. I mean, uh, so it's an exciting time for, for Lafayette football. You've come home. Yeah, this is home for me. This is, you know, I grew up on this campus, you know, as a kid. I, heck, when I was at Phillipsburg, I used the library, come to camps here. So uh, it's been great to get back around so many wonderful people and uh, in this community as well. Football, it's not hard to have football in your blood when you grow up in Phillipsburg. I mean, it's a hotbed of high school football for sure. Uh, so I'm sure football has always been part of your life, right? Yeah, you know what? I mean, I grew up as a kid wanting to play in, you know, for Phillipsburg and obviously in the Phillipsburg Eastern rivalry here on campus. Uh, that was a dream as a kid. And if I didn't grow up in that community, maybe I wouldn't have the love that I have for football. I think that community developed my passion and, and it's why I do what I do today because of, uh, the, you know, the success that we had there. Winning was expected there. Uh, you know, much like it's going to be expected here, you know, and everywhere I've been, you know, I take a little bit of Phillipsburg, every program I've been a part of, uh, it's, it's been uh, a part of the programs that we've built. The fact that you do live so close to Lafayette and played some games at Lafayette uh, in high school, did that have anything to do with your decision to come to Lafayette? How did that come about? You know, I mean, it's, it's funny you ask. I mean, I was a first generation student. Um, you know, when, when I was being recruited, um, education was important to my parents. You know, for me, football was really important. And, uh, <laughs> you know, the, the best thing that ever happened to me was coming here because of, you know, it taught me how to think critically. I really grew as, as a person here and the people that I met and the friends that I have, uh, you know, this place, you know, one of my mottos is going to be for this place. It's not four years, but a lifetime. And, and that's true. I mean, you know, when I think about all the guys who have reached out, guys I don't even know from, from the 80s. Uh, you know, I just got off the phone the other day with Joe Coffey. Joe and I, the only connection we had was uh, Mike Donnelly uh, coached us both. You know, mm -hmm. both coached Donnelly, but Joe's a tremendous guy. And, you know, you reconnect with Phil Ng and guys that I didn't even play with. And then guys that I played with. And then Dave Nelson was here the other day, um, you know, and spoke to the team, you know. And so just to reconnect with people and, uh, it's been just a lot of fun and you know, I just I have a love for Lafayette now, you know, and, and the education part 
you know, I'm grateful for what this place did for me and where it got me uh, in life. Well, before we leave Fisher Stadium as a high school student, and I'm not sure you've made your team or anybody else aware of this, but uh, you became almost a national star uh, in the Easton Phillipsburg game in 1988 uh, at Fisher Field. The starting quarterback from Phillipsburg was not you, uh, but he got injured and uh, you came on the field and led uh, your team to a game winning fourth quarter drive. One of the greatest high school games that ESPN ever had on at that time. Uh, is that still a great memory for you or are you kind of trying to sick and tired of people talking about it? No, I mean, you know, it, it's, it's, a, it is a great memory. I mean, obviously, um, you know, to have the, the chance to play on national TV and then to do that, you know, I think I took a lot of things away from it, you know, that, you know, I wasn't the starter, but being prepared in a time when, when your number's called is important, you know, and I hope, uh, you know, someday when, when kids see it, they say, Hey, you know, I got to have my, myself ready for when I get called on, but it, it is, it's, it's a great, it's a great memory. Um, you know, it's, it's something I'll always remember, but you know, it's not something that I dwell on or, you know, I don't go back and watch it too often. I think I showed mm -hmm. my daughters the first time, like two or three years ago when they were teenagers. So, and, uh, but, um, you know, I still root for Peaberg every year. So sorry for the Easton people. <laughs> well, I think for every Easton Peaberg fan, that, that game is kind of etched in their, in their minds that they were around. Uh, they either watched it on ESPN or they were there. The, the place was packed for sure. Yeah. You know, I talked to uh, one of the assistant coaches who coached you, uh, Mike Joseph, who sits alongside of me when we do the football games. And I said, tell me a little bit about coach. And he said, well, you know what? He wasn't really, really very fast. He was in the secondary, but he wasn't the fastest guy back there. He said, but he was so smart, so inquisitive, so eager to learn that uh, I just could not put anybody else in there because he was the voice of the team. He was the leader of the team. And he had the toughness that no one else had on that team. Uh, accolades that I think uh, are just wonderful. They talk, say a great deal about you as a person. And I'm sure those are attributes you want to instill in, in all your players. Yeah, that, that means a lot that he said that about me. I mean, it really does. You know, I, you know, I wasn't the greatest player, you know, and I, and I hope when I see guys and when they come back, though, that they'll say that I was a great teammate, you know, and a guy who cared about the team and would do anything to help us succeed, you know, um, one, of, one of the greatest things that they haven't here was in, in 92, winning a Patriot League championship, um, you know, and it's, it's kept us all tied together, you know, and, mm -hmm. and, and the friendships, you know, right. I mean, trophies gather dust, but friendships never do. And um, so that, that means a lot that he would say that about me. And like I said, I hope, I hope they know that uh, I wasn't a pain to them, I hope, and, and that I gave <laughs> everything I had uh, to help them succeed. He speaks so highly of you, Coach. Uh, you majored in government and law. Did, did you have aspirations to be a lawyer, or did you always know it was going to be about football? So, you know, much like uh, Coach Saint, you know, I, I think as a young kid, you know, my goal was maybe to teach and go back and become the head football coach at Phillipsburg High School. Mm -hmm. uh, was was probably a dream at one point in my life. And I got a call one day from, from Mike Donnelly, who was at Columbia at the time. He said, hey, he said, you know, do you have interest in, in coaching? And I'm like, yeah. And so he said, well, let me bring it down and meet with Ray Tellier and interview. And I got to Columbia. I had the opportunity uh, to get my master's there, uh, which I'm very proud of. And I got hooked. You know, I, I just I loved it so much that I didn't want to get out of college coaching because I got to wake up every day. I was like, man, they're going to pay me to coach football. You know, <laughs> all those years of being in two a day camps and uh, you know, now, uh, like I said, it, it was just a, a passion that I had. And it all started probably way back when I was a, a little kid playing in the backyard all the way through high school, uh, right, right into playing in two of the best rivalries ever in Easton and Phillipsburg and Lafayette and Lehigh. I'm, uh, you already led to a couple of things I want to talk about. I'm going to give you a coach's name. You tell me uh, what, what they instilled on, in you and what are some of the things you take away from them as a head coach. We'll start with Bill Russo. Uh, coach Russo, I'll tell you what, got, you know, bless him. Uh, you know, the one thing I remember is my senior year at the banquet, uh, he presented an award to me. And when I went up, he gave me a hug and he said, you're going to make a great coach. Not even knowing that I was going to get into coaching, but those are the words. And so, 
you know, I've thought about that often. And, you know, even coming back here when, when I got the job, one of the things I thought of is, you know, he said that and I want to make him proud and, and, and make his prediction come true. You know, so I, I really, uh, you know, he was great to me. Uh, you know, and I, I can't thank him enough for the opportunity he gave me to come here to Lafayette. That award, by the way, was the unsung hero, which kind of fits what everybody has said about you as a football player. You went on, as you mentioned, you went to Columbia under another great coach, Ray Tellier. Tell me a little bit about him. Wow. You know what? If he called me today and said, I need you to coach for me and I can't pay you, I would go and coach for Ray Tellier. Uh, again, he gave me a great opportunity. You know, and the one thing about Coach Tellier was he was he was fair. He was honest. He was a good person and he instilled that you can win by doing it the right way and even when he had to deal with um with our players in terms of trying to get the best 22 on the field he would switch guys positions and guys would do it because they would run through a wall for him because of who he was as a person and so he instilled that in me and and uh you know i took that from him i wanted to emulate his coaching style and certainly he brought success to columbia which they hadn't had before uh which again demonstrates his ability. Yeah, I mean, uh, I was fortunate to get there at the right time. You know, my third year, uh, we got him to eight and two, which was the first time since I think 1961. And, uh, you know, we had some, some great kids and some great players. And, uh, you know, it was, it was definitely a challenge. Everything was always a little bit harder at Columbia. You know, when you flew a kid mm -hmm. in, you had to drive to North to pick him up. When, so it, it really instilled a lot of hard work and it, it was a tough place to turn around. Uh, which also made me believe that you can go anywhere and turn it around. One of the guys there once told me, you know, there's no such thing as a bad job, you know, do a great job there and make it the one that everybody wants. So, uh, so I took that from that place. Then you go on uh, to go back to a friend and coach at Muhlenberg under Mike Donnelly, who everybody in the Lehigh Valley knows what a great person he was and what a terrific coach he was. Yeah, he, and, and a great friend to me. I mean, you know, he, he taught me a lot. I mean, he taught me a lot about football. And, and when I say that, he always made you think about why you were doing something and ask the question, why? Not, don't just do it because everybody else does it, but why are you going to do it? And we would sit there and argue at night, you know, you know, why do you want to step with your right foot and not your left foot? You know, and he would challenge you. And it really made you think the game. And, you know, I, I can't thank him enough for everything. I wish he was here to, to, to be here to help, you know, because he was always a great sounding board. And he always gave great advice. And, uh, you know, if, if I can be half of the coach as him, I'm telling you, we're going to win lots of championships. Because, like I said, he was just – he loved football and he knew everything about it. And he was a great, great mentor to me. Your longest tenure as an assistant coach uh, then was coming back full circle to Lafayette. With head coach Frank Tavani, you spent five years here with Frank Tavani's teams, the Joe McCourt years. Everybody remembers those uh, championships in 04, 05, 06. Uh, so that had to be just a, a great time for you as an assistant and working with Coach Tavani. Yeah, it was. You know, I and again, just uh, just a great experience. You know, we we weren't very good uh, when Coach T took over the program, and and we worked hard. You know, and. And the one thing that coach always instilled was he always used the term code red recruit every day, you know, and it was, it was about recruiting. It was about getting great guys and we brought in great kids and we didn't bring in measurements and we didn't, we brought in good kids who were good football players that were going to work hard for us. And uh, so if there's anything I took from coach T it's, it's make sure that, you know, you're out there recruiting and, and that's, what's going to make your program successful. Also, you got such a great background. You've been a running backs coach, a defensive backs coach, a special teams coordinator, a quarterbacks coach, a receiver coach, a recruiting coordinator, an offensive coordinator. I think you checked all the block, all the boxes in order to become a head coach. Uh, yeah, you know what? Now I just got to stay out of the way and let the guys that are, <laughs> that are here coach and coach because because you know they always say hire guys that are smarter than you, and I guarantee you that I did and. Uh, so we're going to be off and running with, with, with those guys making a lot of, uh, you know, decisions and, and helping build this program. One guy will not do this alone. It's going to be uh, a collective effort amongst all of us. 15 years at f &M, how difficult was it to leave there with, with such a successful program? I mean, year in, year out, you were headed to the postseason. Yeah, you know what? Um, it was hard. I mean, you, you build something, it's hard to walk away from it. 
at the same time, this was probably the one place that I would have left for, you know, and, and I did obviously, but uh, you know, again, you know, when I was a young kid, young coach, you know, one of the things that I wanted to do was go out and learn as much as I could to have a chance to come back here again and make everybody proud, you know, and, and put us in a position to compete for Patriot league championships and play in the NCAAs, you know, and, and my dream is, is that we're going to win the league and that, you know, we're going to fill this, the stands here and we're going to host mm -hmm. an NCAA game someday. And, uh, and that's what we're going to work for. I'll ask you the question that I asked Jeff, how tough is it on the family? You spend all those years now at F and M, everybody settled in and now all of a sudden you're coming back home again, but, I guess it's not quite as difficult because you come back home anyway, just to, to visit. Well, yeah. I mean, we come back home to visit. Uh, it was harder to take our kids at one and two away from family and move down there. It's a little bit easier mm -hmm. now. Uh, and uh, you know, I'm going to still get to spend a lot of time with my daughter summer because I'm going to end up being a parent of 26. So she's got admitted into the college and she's coming here. So I'm ecstatic about that. And now I have to get my daughter Capri who's a junior and will be a senior next year. I got to get her, to see if we can get her here to join the family. So, um, but no, my kids have been, have been great. My wife, Pam has been great and has let me do this job, uh, which isn't easy on our family. Sometimes mm -hmm. it's like, it's not on assistant coaches. Um, you know, I'm spending more time with our team now than I am my daughters. And, and I can't thank them enough for letting me do that. You know, if they're going to be a part of our team, uh, you know, I'm hoping that our family will, will know who our kids are, our team. They'll be immersed in this college. Uh, just like they were at F&M. You know, my daughters didn't miss many games. I think my oldest was a little upset last year at the last F&M game. She was crying because she wasn't going to be able to be on the field after games anymore and say congratulations. Uh, but now she's coming here, so she's going to have to do it again. Yeah, perfect. Perfect uh, a changeover from, from there to here. Uh, I asked the coaches why they wanted to coach for you. I'll ask you why you wanted them to coach with you. So you know what? When, when I... When I got the job, the first thing I wanted to do was put together a great staff. You know, obviously, I thought it was really important to try and get some alums back on staff, um, partly because they understand this place, what we're recruiting academically. Um, they know uh, they have relationships already with alumni, which I think is really important. But the number one thing for me really was to hire really good people. You know, we all know how to draw up power and counter or four from the field or you know, but it was about uh, guys that could build relationships with our kids. It was about getting guys who were hungry and wanted to work hard. Um, and, uh, and really, honestly, you know, a bunch of the guys who are with me, I've worked with before and they're just, they're great people. You know, this is, this is a relationship business. Uh, this is about, um, you know, going out and building relationships with recruits. It's about building relationships with your players. And it's also about building relationships with people on this campus. So I, you know, you know, I love the guys that are here in this building. I mean, we're, we get along great. It's fun to come to work every day. And yet we all have the same kind of vision and goals, which is, you know, uh, you know, we want to win. And, and every guy that's on the staff wanted to be here. And that was really important that, they, that there was a want to be at Lafayette, not just saying, hey, I'm here for a stepping stone. I want to see the place do well. Mm -hmm. Well, I think we'd be remiss if we didn't at least mention uh, the other coaches on your staff. Uh, Kevin Ballman, uh, assistant head coach, offensive line. Uh, maybe a word about Kevin. Kevin's been with me for uh, 13 years. Um, he's an incredible offensive line coach. I really don't have to worry about. We kind of think the same way. So he's already thinking about what I'm thinking about before I even thought about it. So he's uh a great family man and uh and he's a great friend you know like i said he's been tremendously loyal and i i'm just i guess i'm biased because he's here and he's a friend there isn't a better offensive line coach in the country he could coach in the nfl he could coach at michigan uh he could coach anywhere so uh we're, i'm excited that he's here working with our kids tj demuzio uh, offensive coordinator quarterbacks coach yeah tj is awesome tj is is uh, an up-and-coming bright star in this profession um you know, he's been uh, uh, a guy that I followed from the time I used to work camps down at Delaware when he was just a GA, and I followed his, his path in coaching, and he's just done a great job. I mean, he's a great recruiter. He's a really good football mind, and uh, I'm excited that he's getting to lead our offense. You know, it, it was his time to get an opportunity to do that, 
Um, and, and I also wanted to surround him with, with great guys so that he can achieve all the things he wants to as an offensive coordinator. Uh, but I'm so excited that he's here. People are going to love what we're doing when they get to see it. Plucked a guy from the NFL, Ryan Roeder, who uh, worked with the, uh, with the Giants. He'll be the wide receiver coach. Yeah, Ryan's, uh, again, I, I've known Ryan for a long time. His brother Jason over at Freedom. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it was important also to, right, we're trying to build community and, and local football is really big around here. We'd love to get some local kids. And he's got a ton of experience. Uh, and again, just a great person. I mean, they said it's hard for me to talk about these guys because they're great people. You know, they're, they're, they're guys that, you know, you want, you want your son to play for. And, uh, and Ryan's just a tremendous asset to our program. Anthony Johnson, running backs coach. AJ. So uh, he's the only guy. First, he's maybe one of the funniest guys I know. I, I love him. Uh, he's probably the only guy, maybe, maybe one or two guys I didn't know. But I didn't know AJ. Uh, I got a recommendation on him. He was down at Shippensburg co coaching a running back. So I was really trying to find the best running back coach we could find. And I called him. And he was – he said, Coach, uh, is there any chance we could talk later about this? He said, I'm driving my mom home. And I knew right then, when your mom becomes more important than a job, he's the right guy. And he came up here, blew us away in the interview. Uh, he's just tremendous. You know, just he's, he's a huge, huge asset to our program because uh, he brings a lot of uh, levity and laughter. I'm really looking forward to getting to meet all of these guys. Tyler Knoll, tight ends. Yeah, uh, Tyler was down at Randolph-Macon. He was the offensive coordinator down there. Uh, again, uh, he's going to coach our tight ends. Uh, he's from Nazareth. So, again, getting another local guy, Lehigh Valley guy, back home. Um, you know, and, uh, you know, Pedro Ruzo, who's the head coach down there, said that, you know, this is his time. He's ready. And, again, I thought, you know, with, with TJ taking over as a coordinator, all of these guys have coordinator experience, which mm -hmm. helps your offensive coordinator just – to bounce ideas off of or to bring ideas to the table. So I thought that was really important uh, and fired up to have him here. Another NFL guy, Andrew Samoa, uh, recruiting yeah. coordinator, outside linebackers. Yeah, you know what? Andrew was on the last staff, and he's he's been invaluable to our program. I mean, um, you know, just coming in, uh, um, everybody from the administration to the other coaches who were on staff, everybody said if there's one guy that you should really consider keeping around, it's Andrew. And we're so grateful because he's our recruiting coordinator. So he's done a tremendous job in putting together uh, all of our recruiting weekends, you know, where coaches are going, uh, which kids we're offering. Um, so he, he will be, um, and, and he, we moved this position, you know, he's our defensive line coach here last season. He's now coaching the outside linebackers and he's getting involved with, so he can grow his resume a little bit. Um, mm -hmm. But again, just, just a salt of the earth guy comes from a football family, loves football and just great to be in the office with him. And I'm so glad that, that he agreed to stay and, and be a part of our staff. Safety's coach will be Mead uh, Clint Daniel. Yeah. Mead, uh, Mead and I had coached together for the last three years at F and M. I knew Mead from my days of working the Princeton camps 25 years ago. Uh, so we were friends, you know, and uh, he was spent 13 years as a defensive coordinator at Davidson College, uh, which is a Division One program down in the Carolinas, and uh, did a great job there uh, before becoming a DC at Kenyon, and then I stole him away from there to help us. Uh, so, I, you know, he's he again having coordinator experience. I think will bring, uh, you know, a sounding board for for Coach Saint Germain and, and the defensive staff. And last but certainly not least, maybe the happiest guy coming in has to be the defensive line coach with uh, Malik Ham and company. Uh, that's Dante Wilkins. Yeah, Dante, uh, you know, we're, we're excited to have Dante. He is a, he's a really good coach. Um, you know, he was a, a captain and a leader down at the University of Virginia. He has some strength background, um, you know, at, when he was at UCLA and then came back and was coaching at the University of Virginia. And, uh, and we're, we're ecstatic that he's with us because, again, he's going to make us pretty good up front because uh, he gets after those guys pretty good. All right, as you get ready for the spring game on Saturday, I'll bring in the other guys. And uh, Jeff, getting back to you, can you give us a quick synopsis of uh, the cornerback situation for the year? I think the biggest thing since getting here is uh, getting guys who are willing to compete. You know, Coach Saint talked about running to the football and executing uh, what we're trying to do on defense. Um, the best part about this spring is it's been teaching and installing uh, new defensive philosophy and uh, just new learning for all those guys. Uh, it's a young group. 
an eager group. Uh, it's cool to see them compete on Saturday and uh, put it all together. And Mike, how about uh, you in charge of the defensive unit? Can you talk a little bit about their strengths and some of the weaknesses you're going to have to overcome? I think you know, in terms of the strengths, I think there's a willingness and uh, guys are, again, the effort's been good and we've hit that standard more often than not over the last 13 practices. I think, you know, if you wanted to go and label anything a weakness, it's just been familiarity, you know, between the coaching staff and the players. And I think throughout, we're, we're already better than we were when we got here in January, better than, you know, we got through spring break and then through 13 practices, it's one thing to go walk through something on cans and no helmets, no ball, no, you know, 11 live bodies across the way from you. But now, you know, there's definitely more familiarity. And I think it's just going to take another jump as we get into the summer. And to me, that jump can occur in July. Uh, the question for a defensive coordinator is, and for the players, how difficult to go from a system they played in before and now a new system in terms of language, in terms of what you like to do, in terms of the way you position people. How tough is it for the young men to learn all of that over again? I'd say it's more than anything. It's uh, it's probably a little bit of semantics because the way it was said six months ago and the way it's being said now, it could be the same technique. Mm -hmm. and, it's really just trying to translate that. And there have been moments where guys will use a term that they've used in the past. And if that's going to help them understand it faster, then go ahead. And they've, they've done that. And for the older guys, it's been a little bit easier for the younger guys. I think it's been a little bit, you know, more of a, you know, a curve just because, you know, they went from their high school defense to their college defense to another defense. So, you know, you're talking about three different, sets of language in nine months that that can be that can put your head in the spinning a little bit so but for the most part I think they've understood what we're asking and we're getting to where we need to be. John how about on the offensive side maybe a little bit more difficult uh, to, to use a different uh, language to use a different way to call a system how tough has it been on the your young quarterbacks and uh, your offensive unit? Yeah, I mean, I, I think they're adapting well. You know, I think uh, we've done a really good job uh, of teaching them prior to even getting into spring ball, you know, with some walkthroughs that we did. Um, you know, we're, we're young, you know, I mean, we're, we're young on offense. Uh, you know, when you look right now with health and in, in spring, six of the nine offensive linemen are, are freshmen. Um, you know, right now, Jaden Sutton's hurt, uh, you know, who was a starting tailback last year. Uh, you know, when you look at tight end, Mason Gilbert has had some, some injuries, which we moved uh, Justin Matala over to tight end, Gabe Decker back to tailback. So what's, what's really been good is, is that we've gotten guys a lot of reps who maybe, not, who maybe didn't play a lot last year. So mm -hmm. it's helped us develop some of those younger kids into seeing what we really have as we head into the summer. Um, you know, but, you know, I, I think we're going to be fine. You know, I think some of the things we're doing offensively that we brought with us from, from F&M, uh, fit what our kids can do well, you know, and, uh, and that's what I'm really hoping. Interesting. That leads to one of the questions we have from a viewer, uh, coach Troxel, what lessons did you take to F and M from Lafayette? And then what are you bringing back to Lafayette now? Uh, the lessons I took, uh, were winning, you know, and, and building a winning culture that, that it takes a great group of kids uh, and, and guys to play for each other, you know, and I think when you look back to the time I was here at Lafayette, you know, those guys played for each other. They're great friends. I mean, two of them are on the screen right now, you know, mm -hmm. but, uh, but all those guys are still really well connected. And really what we had to do at F&M was change a culture and get guys to believe in each other, told everybody the same standard. And we're going to bring that back here, that the kids are going to have a standard of excellence, you know, whether it's up on the hill or whether it's, down here on the field that they're going to do things the right way. Uh, you know, Coach Shaw out at, at Stanford once said, if you have a smart football team in the classroom, you will have a winning record. You'll have a great record. And uh, we have smart kids here. And now we mm -hmm. just have to bring a, di a little bit different culture and get the kids to play for each other. Final question of the night. What do you uh, want to get out of Saturday's game? Uh, you know, I, I think... Health, you know, we want to come out of it healthy. That's a big thing. 
Um, you know, we're already banged up a little bit. You know, I think, um, you know, it's going to be a great opportunity for us to just evaluate uh, everything that we've done this spring, you know, the, the fundamentals of the game, see who tackles well, see who blocks well, um, you know, who can make plays in space, you know, things like that. So I'm looking forward to just, just really getting a chance to see the kids, uh, you know, out there playing football, you know, I mean, coming out of a pandemic and not having a chance to have a spring, this is the first time all these kids have even gone through a spring. So, so for us, uh, you know, hopefully we have a lot of fun doing it uh, to finish off spring the right way, which can springboard us right into July and, and August into having a, a great preparation for next season. I thought it was going to be the last question, but we have another question from a viewer, and this is for, for Mike and for Jeff. Uh, coaches, what does your process look like to keep guys healthy? That has been one of the bugaboos the last few years is keeping good players healthy. Uh, any thoughts on that? I'll start with Mike. I think part of it is the way we practice in terms of the way we're going to compete and practice. And you know, the one thing you'll hear me say to these guys a lot is if it doesn't show up on Tuesday and Wednesday, it's going to struggle to show up on Saturday the way you want it to. So I, I think that's part of it. And the other part is developing depth. Mm -hmm. you know, guys should be tired if we are out there for four, five, six, seven plays in a row and you're running the way you should be, you should be tired. So, you know, developing quality depth behind them. And then, you know, you'll get to certain points in the year where you're going to know when to slow it down and times when you need to speed it up. And to me, that's where my time at Kutztown was invaluable. You know, you're playing sometimes 12, 13, 14 games in a row. You know, we, we were lucky to get a bye the one year. You, you learn how to, you know, when to port it on and when to pull off. Jeff, you're the medical guy. Uh, how are you going to keep everybody healthy? I think the biggest thing that I learned when I was here is uh, taking care of my body off the field, uh, whether it's getting rest at night or getting in early to get on the bike, getting heat, and then um, listening uh, to my body when things are sore or aching. Uh, I think with our guys here is having that open line of communication, um, asking them how they're doing, see, seeing how their bodies are feeling, and that way uh, we can plan accordingly. But Got to have that relationship with them. Got to have that trust with them to be able to uh, make those uh, plans uh, moving forward. Well, on that note, I'm looking forward to a great relationship with all three of you guys and the rest of the coaching staff. And I'll see you on Saturday. And uh, John, we'll talk again on Saturday after the game. And uh, thanks so much for joining us on, uh, on Primetime Parts tonight. Thank you very much. That's it for us, uh, for all of us. We thank you so much for joining us. Once again, this has been Primetime Pards. I'm Gary Laubach. Go Pards. Good night, everybody.